Well, all right, good morning, everybody. Good to see you guys. 11.30, you showed up on time, and you guys are the ones that get the whole message. So way to go for you guys. Hey, my name is Brian. I'm the lead pastor here. Really grateful that you would choose to worship with us today here at Crossroads. And our mission statement is that we exist to lead everyone to discover Jesus and follow him fully, and we wanna help you take a next step with him. Now, to explain that a little bit, we believe that everyone should have a one in their life, one person that they're investing in, connecting with, telling about Jesus, inviting them to church, and so that we could all discover who Jesus is, follow him fully with our lives, and then lead others to do the very same thing. And so, we're grateful that you're with us, we're grateful that you would uh, accompany us in that mission. And if you're joining us online at Crossroads Online, we love you guys. Thanks for being here with us. Don't forget to connect with your chat hosts throughout the service. They'd love to know who you are and also to be able to give you some links to help you throughout the service with us today. But guys, we are in, honestly, a really cool series, in the middle of a series that is called 316. Uh, and 316 is a series that we are looking at a few of the 316s that are in the Bible. And, and I realize that not everyone grew up in church or, or not everybody even maybe owns a Bible. Or if you did own a Bible, maybe it was like to be able to fix one of those tables that were a little like funky and so you shoved it underneath there to level it out. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so I thought it would just take a second to explain this 316 number stuff and where it all kind of came from. Uh, to do that, let me take a, one bigger step back and remind us that the Bible is one book that is made up of 66 books. And those books are broken into two sections of the Bible known as the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, the Old Testament has 39 books in it. It describes the events before Jesus was born. And then, doing quick math, you'll know that the New Testament has 27 books in it. And this captures the period of time when Jesus was born, when he had his ministry, when he was crucified, when he was buried, when he resurrected from death, he sent it back into heaven, and then what happened after he was gone. But within each of these books, there are chapters and there are verses that are in the each, each book. Now, I'll give you an example. So John, for instance, you'll notice that the big number is the chapter number, and then underneath here and inside the text are what are called the verse numbers. So the big numbers are the chapters, the small ones are the verses, and you should know that when the Bible was originally created, it didn't have those in there. We kind of talked about that last week, but over the course of time, they uh, added them added to it. So you could have better directions, you can navigate your Bible a little bit better, and just interact with it in an easier way. And it wasn't until about 1560 or so that, the, so that the first Bible that had both chapter and verses in it came out, and when it was created. And, and I say that to explain how this 316 series kind of came to be. The, the most famous chapter 3, verse 16 verse in the Bible has always been John 316, which says... For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It's a massively, hugely important verse to understand. In fact, we spent an entire sermon last weekend talking about just that one verse. So if you missed that, I'd encourage you to go back as we kicked off the 316 series. But what I found is that as I read my Bible more and I bumped into more of those 316s, they would stand out to me also. They seemed really, really powerful. So I took the time to, to look up as many as I could find, write all of them in there, and I realized that as I ran into them, they were really awesome. And so what I did was I looked them up. I noticed, though, that there was more than a, a numerolo numerological coincidence happening there, more than just that. In fact, there was a pattern of what a disciple of Jesus looked like as I read these 316s over and over that in these 316s should be what every disciple, every follower of Jesus looks like that they should be doing or that they should be marked by in their life. So we chose the image of a tattoo to be the illustration of what being marked by these 316s would look like. That these 316s should be a permanent reminder to all of us of what God desires a disciple of Jesus to look like and then to be doing in their life. So over the next few weeks, what we do is we're looking at these few different 316s in the Bible to see how they point us to a closer relationship with Jesus. And then each week, what we'll do for you is give you a memory verse card to take with you to, so that you can really start to be marked by these verses. Now, last weekend, we had a shipping delay of our memory verse cards. Um, I won't say what, what group uh, delayed them, but it does rhyme with MedX, so um, just to let you know. Um, anyway. 
Um, but today, you're gonna get a bonus. So you are going to get this week's card and last week's card at the same time. So you'll get John 3.16 and 1 John 3.16 and then the 3.16 that we'll be working on today as you exit today. You can also get them digitally, though, if you wanna make like a screensaver on your phone or anything like that. You can go to get that on the Crossroads Grace app, which we'll be using in service today. So if you haven't downloaded that, I'd encourage you to do that, the Crossroads Grace app, great place to be at. And we wanna use these 316s, though, to mark our souls and to stamp our lives for Jesus. Now, for this week's 316, we're gonna be in 1 Corinthians 316. So if you have your Bibles or if you have that Crossroads Grace app like I asked you to, you could turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter three and look in verse 16. And the words that we'll find there are really, really important because what we'll find is that they're massively important to all of us on a daily basis. Because what we'll see is how they are actually gonna affect us regardless of if you're a Christian or not. So, so, which means that if you're here, you're not sure about God or the Bible or any of that kind of stuff, what you're gonna see is that this 316 will even affect you if you really are honest with yourself. So let's read the, the, the 316 today, 1 Corinthians 316, to give us some idea. And here it is, it says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple in that God's spirit dwells in your midst. Now, with all of these 316s, or any, really, any individual verse that you bump into in the Bible, it's very important how you handle that verse. And what I mean by that is, in order to fully appreciate the verse that you're studying, you need at least one key thing to look at, and that is a word called context. Context, okay? You, you need to know a little bit about like who wrote it and who it was written to or why it was written or even the verses that surround that singular verse because if you don't, you could run the risk of really not understanding it all the way or even worse, misusing it completely. So uh, let me just give you a, a couple examples of what that, that means. So how many people have seen this phrase before? Money is the root of all evil. You ever heard that before? Money is the root of all evil? Now, did you know that that's actually a twisting and really a misconception of an actual Bible verse? It's 1 Timothy 6.10. So if we look at the actual quote, and it's quoted out of the King James translation, you'll see that it actually says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. It's a big difference. You know, money's, it's not money's fault, it's just an inanimate object, like you can't do anything. It's the, it's the love that we put on the money that is the root of all evil. So if you just take that at face value, you're gonna miss, you're not gonna have the right context and you'll use it completely differently. Now, let me give you one outside the Bible for you to consider. Now, has, has anybody ever heard this phrase before? This phrase, it says, though she be but little, she is fierce. Anybody heard that? Maybe like an English class or anything like that? Okay, maybe you've heard that. And it's kind of a cool phrase. You think, well, I could put that above my little girl's bed, you know, or I'll, I'll text it to her right before a big test, you know, be fierce, little one, you know? Could be, could be a great thing to do. Just as long as you know the full context of where it comes from. This comes from Shakespeare's A Midsummer's Night Dream, and it's actually part of an of a interaction where, where it comes up where two girls are in a brawl with one another because one of their fiancés suddenly starts to like another girl. And so as these girls are getting beat up, one of them yells for somebody standing nearby, and they say this full phrase. They say, when she is angry, she is keen and shrewd. She was a vixen when she went to school, and though she be but little, she is fierce. It's a big difference. So unless you're texting your daughter before she gets into a brawl, it might not be, you know, hey, throw some haymakers. Like, I don't, it may not be the best phrase to use, but context will explain that to you. So here's some context for today's 316. The first thing we need to know is the author. The author of 1 Corinthians is a guy by the name of Paul. He's an apostle Paul is what he's called. Now, Paul's a cra his story is crazy. He was a Christian killer, okay? He killed Christians until one day he would miraculously became a Christian by, by Jesus getting a hold of him, becomes a missionary and a church planter. And now where we run into him in 1 Corinthians is he's writing to a church that he planted in the city of Corinth. Now, that brings up the second thing that we need to know. What about this Corinth place? Now, the city of Corinth was a Greco-Roman city. It was very influential, very wealthy because of its geographical orientation. And as a result, though, Corinth had a great deal of diversity. 
It, a lot of people would come in and out of Corinth, and so it had a cultural diversity that created a, a melting pot of ideas and beliefs when people would come through, which explains why paganism and idol worship were rampant in the city. They believed in multiple gods, they did whatever pleased them in the moment, right? And this resulted in Corinth being known as a place of unimaginable immorality, just crazy stuff, which then tells us this, that this means that Paul is writing these words to a church in a city full of sexual sin and idolatry and just plain, ugh, just evil everywhere. And, and so this is part of the reason that Paul was writing not just one, but two letters to this church in Corinth, which is First and Second Corinthians. And the reason he wrote in the first place was to address some shenanigans that were happening in the church because of this crazy town that they lived in. But as harsh as this city sounds, this is exactly where churches should be at. We should be in the middle of the mess, not running around and not running away from it, but we need to be in the middle of the mess so we can point people to Jesus, which is the hope of the world. This is what disciples of Jesus should be doing. And so as Paul would say to another church, another kind of crazy city in the middle of Rome, he would say this in Romans chapter 10, verse 14 to, to really all of us. It says, how then they, that's people far from God, how can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? So what that's saying is that it's up to us as followers of Jesus, as disciples, to take the good news, the gospel message of Jesus to the world. And that's a high calling. But it's one that Jesus has entrusted each of us to do. Because I'm not sure if you knew this, but the goal of accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior in your life was not to accept him in your life and then like build a bus and, and put it in the backyard and then hunker down until either the end times come or Jesus or you die, right? You know, that's not the whole point. The idea is that Jesus says, now that you know who I am, you are called to do something with what I told you to do. That's why I can never stress what Jesus' words in Matthew 28 are. I can never stress them enough where it says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So Jesus is saying, I need you to go, I need you to make, I need you to tell people, I need you to tell the world about me and everything that I taught you, Jesus says. And so that is what Paul wants for the, the Christians in Corinth to do and what he also wants us to do. But what we see in chapter three is that the church has kind of gotten spiritually constipated in a little bit of a way. And the reason is the church has gotten stuck with some leadership issues of who's in charge of who and who's following who. But, but Paul was saying that we shouldn't get caught up in who's in charge or who's, who's getting the credit for what. We need to get focused on Jesus. So he says that some are going to plant some seeds, other people will water the seeds, other people will get the harvest of those seeds. If we were to put it in our vernacular, that some will walk with people to help them discover Jesus, other people will help them follow them in their, their life, and then there will be other people that will lead others to know who Jesus is, lead them to lead others to know who Jesus is. But at the end of the day, it's about working together as a body of Christians to help others know who Jesus is. So Paul would say it this way, though, in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, just a couple of verses before our 316, he would say, for we, that's Christians, we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Now, I love this imagery where he says that we are co-workers. Now, I know for some of you, you might think of your co-worker at work and you're starting to break out in hives and you're like, ooh, you know, I can't even imagine that. But that's not exactly what we're talking about here. We're talking about as Christians that we work together in our life and not live in silos. This is why we talk about serving so much, getting involved in a tag team, because we believe that using our gifts and our talents to help others honors God as we do it together. It's why we talk about we believe in community and being in growth groups, because we believe that if we work together, we'll learn about Jesus better. This is why giving to the church is such an important thing, it's a big part of our spiritual walk. It's because together, as coworkers, we can make the biggest impact on Jesus instead of saying, oh, it's for other people to take care of that. It's we are co-workers together. But Paul makes sure that in order to do that, he says we have to have the right foundation in our life, that we have to understand the why and the how that we do that, 
that you and I have to build our lives on what Jesus is telling us to do, especially if we're then telling other people to do that very same thing. And so this is why Paul mentions this idea of that we are God's field. He actually calls us a building. Now, why would he say a building? When you're talking about foundation and everything, he says building in a, in a way to kind of set up what he's about to say in verse 16, which is the one that we look at today. And he says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? Now, this is critical. We need to understand this. We need to understand as we're being marked by a disciple what this means. But again, context is so important for us to really grasp what Paul is actually saying. So when Paul is referring to this idea of the temple, what he's doing is he's drawing imagery from the Old Testament. Remember I talked about at the beginning, Bible's broken into two sections, Old Testament before Jesus, New Testament after Jesus, and with Jesus. So he's talking about the Old Testament before Jesus. And before Jesus came, God's spirit, it resided in the temple, which was designed by King David, big guy, but also then constructed by his son, King Solomon, after he died. And it was this massive building, which if you were to, to construct it today, would cost between three and six billion dollars to be able to make what Solomon had constructed. When I was in Israel with my wife a few years ago, I got to actually see what was left of this with my own eyes. And much of it is in rubble because it was destroyed in about 70 AD. But what remains is breathtaking to consider if you kind of put it all back together. Because the temple would have ultimately looked like this when it was constructed. Big walls and big sections and things like that that were there. And it came, contained these different things. Like if you were to come in a certain gate, you would make your way through the temple and you would be slowly gaining through more and more restrictions. So less and less people could get closer and closer as you got to the center. Because really at the center of it, or at the, the farthest end, what was known as the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies was where the presence of God resided. It was the innermost part of the temple, and it was actually separated by this huge veil or curtain. Here's a look at what we're talking about. So in the Holy of Holies, you would find this massive veil that was right here that would keep anyone from getting into the Holy of Holies. You just couldn't get there. Because why? Why would they do this? Because in the Holy of Holies, it was sacred. It was set apart. It was holy. Now, now why, why would they do that? Because God is sacred, and God is holy, and God is set apart. We, we lose sight of the fact that God is sacred in today's day and age, where virtually nothing is sacred, but God is. God is holy, God is set apart, God is sacred. And in fact, only once a year on the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, would the high priest be able to make a sacrifice on the other side of this veil or this curtain in the, in, in the Holy of Holies? It was the only time. At no other time throughout the year could anyone get past this veil, and if they did, they would die. So the temple was the place that people came to be in the presence of God, and it stayed this way until Jesus died on the cross. It was only after Jesus died on the cross that the temple became obsolete because there was no need for a separation to be made between God and man. And, and God did something pretty cool, that when Jesus died on the cross, he gave us a physical reminder of that actuality in, in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Matthew chapter 27, this is after Jesus has died, it says that at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So what we mean by that is that if we look at this, this temple again in the inner court, the Holy of Holies, it means that this curtain that we had talked about here that separated God from it, it was torn from top to bottom, that it split it right down the middle. And what that meant was that the, the gap that was created by our sin between God and us that required a veil, a distance between us, was now filled in by the love of Jesus for us on the cross. That's, that's what that meant. But the question you might have is, is this. Well, if the curtain is gone, then where does God's spirit go? 
I mean, is it like my, my bulldog, my French bulldog, Drea, right? Like, right, this is little Drea, okay? Here's the deal with Drea. Sometimes when the little bit of a crack in the door happens in the front door, she will, boom, she will bolt just like right out of that thing, just like crazy. You would think that we are holding her hostage in the house by the way that that little dog runs out of the door. And she doesn't know where she's going. She's like, I'm, I didn't think it was that bad of a gig, but she's gone, you know? So is, is, is that what happens with the Holy Spirit? Right, the veil's gone, it's like, oh yeah, boom, I'm out of here. No, no, be, because, of, because of Jesus, God's spirit no longer needs a building to reside in. Paul would speak so eloquently to this in Acts chapter 17. In Acts 17, he's preaching in another city called Athens amongst these pagan temples and among these pagan gods, and as he's preaching, he says this in Acts 17. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and listen, and does not live in temples built by human hands. So, so if God's spirit isn't in the temple, it, it's not in a building, and, and it, it's, it's not set apart from us anymore, then where does the spirit live? Like, where does he go? He lives in us. As believers in Jesus, he lives in us. How crazy is that? Listen to what, how Paul describes this, uh, again, in Romans chapter eight. He, he would describe it this way. Um, he would say that, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. So let that wash over you for just a moment. That when we discover who Jesus is and we ask him into our life and say that we wanna follow him with all of our life, it says that the same spirit, right? The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, he says is living in you and living in me. That's like, you are you talking about? That's crazy. And if you're not a Christian, you're probably wondering like, whoa, spirit stuff, what's happening? Like spirits inside you and you have your God in a box and like, what are we doing here? Like, listen, God was never confined to a box. He is omnipotent, he's all encompassing, he's everywhere. His spirit was there so that people could go and be close to him. And I'm not saying that when God's spirit comes in you that your eyes roll in the back of your head, you grow a tail, you become a Dodger fan, like none of that terrible stuff is gonna happen to you, like, right, no. No, what it means is that because Jesus is now in your life, listen, think about this, God's holy, sacred, set apart, perfect spirit now is a proper place to come into your life. All because of Jesus, who made us clean and worthy for that spirit to be there. And when that spirit of God is in you, he will guide you, he will correct you, he will convict you, he will encourage you, he will comfort you, he, he will counsel you in so many other things when he's inside of you. And the way that Paul chose to explain that to the people in Corinth and to us today is to say this in 1 Corinthians 3.16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? It is a reminder to all of us that call Jesus Lord that we are the temple in which the spirit of the living God lives. But let's just really be honest for a second here. Let's just be honest. I'm not all that sure that we're being the best of hosts for the Spirit of God in our life. Because I'll tell you what, a host usually wants to create a really good place for their guests to spend the night. And, and let me be clear, okay, about this host analogy, especially in our spiritual life, I wanna be very clear. This isn't to say that you have to be completely perfect or without any flaw for God to want to come in your life. N not at all. If that were the case, none of us, me included, would ever be worthy for God's spirit in our life. God does the cleaning through Jesus. However, 
it doesn't mean that when we choose to be marked by Jesus as his disciples, that we shouldn't look around our temple a little bit when God's like, hey, what about that? And maybe we should have a little attention to that to clean that up so that God's spirit can work even more in our life. So as we look to be marked by this 316 today, I want us to consider the temple where God's spirit resides right now. Because if I were to summarize what 1 Corinthians 3.16 was saying, it's this. is that your body is a temple. Now, if you heard somebody say, your body's a temple, I get it. That most likely you're expecting it to be from somebody that has like a 32-pack ab set going on, you know, like no neck at all, and, and, and they're super fit, like a Ride 209 instructor, you know what I mean? Like unbelievably fit, right? But check this out, here's the truth. The truth is that it's a frumpy guy by the name of Paul that's the true originator of that phrase. And what he's referring to was not limited to just our physical body, but our mind and our soul. Because it's important to realize that, that all of our body is where the Spirit of God resides. All of it. So if our mind and if our body and if our souls are where God's spirit resides, then what are we as Christians, as disciples of Jesus to do? Well, I think it's important to consider all three of those areas, our mind, our body, and our soul. And I want us to really consider this in this really basic guiding principle as we think, this idea that, that what goes into us will determine what comes out of us, okay? Now, if you've got a junior high mind, get that out of your way right now, okay, we're good. But like, what goes into us will determine what comes out of us. So, so let's, let's just think about this, okay? Let's look at all these different areas today. So let's start off with, with our body. Let's look at our body. How are we taking care of the physical temple that God has given us? Well, if, if we were to look at, and this isn't everybody, but if we're looking at the normal person, right, the normal average person in America, I would tell you that most of the time we're eating a ton of fatty foods, right, just, just living it up, you know, in and out and 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 in and out, right? like fat everywhere, tons of sugar, we're just, we're diving into it. I mean, goodness, there's, there's nitro Pepsi now where they infuse, not, like I don't, I don't even know, right? Like you put that in there, right? And certainly after you eat all that stuff and drink all that, you ain't gonna exercise because you're like, I got nothing left, you know? Like where am I, right? So we don't exercise and we certainly don't sleep at all. Why do we not sleep? Because we've gotta watch so much of our screens that the next thing you know, we're like, it's 3 a.m. and I was just watching TikTok all night long, right? I, the golden retriever was doing the flip. It was amazing, right? So, right, but that, that's what we do, right? We eat terrible, we never sleep, we have all this kind of stuff. And you know what the result is? We are overweight, we're out of shape, and we're mentally unstimulated. And we're not able to do the things that God has, has in store for your life or my life. And, and as I was thinking, I'll be honest with you, I think this is part of the reason that so many people have a hard time growing in their faith. Why they don't join a growth group, why they don't serve. It's actually, a lot of it's because of this. How do I know that? Because how we treat our body will ultimately tell how we feel. And if we have all this stuff in there, we will have no energy, no time, and no motivation. Isn't this true that sometimes you'll say, well, man, I can't, I can't go to church. I'm exhausted after this long week, right? Or I can't serve. There's no way. I just, am, oh, I'm just feeling, right? Hey, how are you treating your body to give you energy to be able to do those things? But, but what would happen if we just treated our body just a little bit differently? What if, what if we had a balanced diet, right? Like mixing a salad. I don't know, you know, like throw something just for fun, right? Like a little balanced diet. What if we reduced sugar? I'm not saying you don't have to drink pop. I'm just saying don't drink a case of it. Just like, like adjust a little bit, right? Just reduce your sugar. Exercise. You, you, don't, you don't have to run a marathon. You don't, just walk. Just get out and get, get moving a little bit. Start there. Exercise. Get the blood flowing. Now, this one, this one's hard, okay? And I realize this is so crazy to even think about, but I'll just say it anyway. What if, what if, what if you read a book, oh, right? Like, I know, I, I know this is just crazy talk right now, but what if you just read a book, and, and they still exist, they're paper and all kinds of stuff, well, read a book, do something to, what if you had some family time, 
even if you don't like your family? What if you had some family time and just spent some time doing things with them? What if you went to bed? Can I get an amen for going to bed? Anybody, right? Oh my goodness. You're thinking about that nap right now? I get it. Oh, right, go to bed. What if you served? What if you just served? Just got involved. Here's the deal. If you did those things, I guarantee in medicine and scientific research will back me up, you will have more energy, you will be more focused, and consequently you will be able to do more that the Holy Spirit is desiring for you to do if you just treat your body the right way. It's not your body. But what about this? What about your, what about your mind? Right? What about your mind? And again, let's just, let's just call, I mean, this is the average, you know, normal, per, what are the things that we have in our minds right now, currently? Well, I'll tell you, the first thing we have in there is others' opinions are right in there. Boy, we care what other people say. A bunch. Uh, social media, we gotta check in with that. That'll gauge our value and our worth based on what everything is happening. It will tell us what our worth is. Did, did you know that the, the most harmful, the har- most harmful thing to your mental health is actually you? Negative self-talk. How are you talking about you? How are you, what are the negative things that you're saying about yourself? We say so much about that. And then we compare ourselves, don't we? Hey, that person has that, I don't have that. I must mean I'm worse than that person. He, th- this person's married, I'm not married yet. I'm just compare it, right? All that mental stuff in there. Now I know when you do read, like what books and what articles are you reading? Like what are you putting into your, into your head? What is, is it a bunch of conspiracy theories all the time? Are you reading things that are helping you? What, do, what are you putting in your Heads. How about, how about this one? How about shows and movies? Now, I'm, I'm not against, you know, like watching a show here and there. I'm just wondering, is it, is it the best way to, to binge watch Seinfeld in 45 minutes? Like, I just don't know if that's the way to do all 11 seasons, right? You know, just what are we putting in our mind? Um, how about this one? What's the company that you're keeping? What, what friends are you choosing to hang out with? What ch- friends are you choosing to listen to? Right, are, are they edifying Jesus or are they not? Um, now, this one might seem a little bit odd, uh, might seem a little bit odd, but uh, this one is, uh, I think so often we stay inside. We could stay inside mentally, but physically we'll just stay inside all the time with our, in, our, in our world. And, and when you are by yourself and you're inside your own head, I could tell you it only gets, man, nasty. But, but and, and, and when was, and let me just say, like, so when this happens, right, when this happens and we get all this stuff, what would be the negative, what's the, here's the deal. If you're constantly around negative people and you're thinking negative thoughts and you're doing negative things, can you help but be in a negative mental space? It, it's virtually impossible. And when all of this is in your head, it's really hard to hear God. It's really, really hard to hear God when all that stuff is in there. But again, what if we chose to just fill our minds with something different? What if we were very careful about the friends that we did choose? What if we were around people that shared your values and loved Jesus? What if we decided to do that? What if we decided to to not quit it, but what if we limited social media and not think that it defined everything that we did, but we just just limited it just a little bit? What if we were mindful of what we read? So... We're not this kind of church that says, you can't read this, you gotta read this, and blah, blah, blah. not that, no, no, no. I'm just saying, hey, just be smart. Like, as you're reading it, does this actually draw me towards Jesus more? Is this allowing me to think, like, what are you, what are you reading? This one is, and, and legitimately, it can be difficult, but it's so important. What if, what if you saw a Christian counselor for some of that negative stuff that's getting put in your head, what if, all those things, what if you sought the professional help of somebody that loved Jesus and wanted to help you think a little bit differently in your life? What if you saw a counselor and what if you cleared your head? Hey, you could say what you want about California, but within an hour, you can be at the ocean or the mountains or all kinds of different places. What if you just got out and you breathed in fresh air and you allowed God to speak with you in a different way? What would be in your mind if you did that? When it comes to our mind, I think it's important to consider what Paul actually says in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse five. He says, we demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Listen, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So do you wanna know the result of capturing every thought, of being mindful of what we're thinking about, of being mindful of our mental temple? 
Here's what will happen. We will stay more focused on Jesus and we will let the Spirit clear our mind out of all the junk that's trying to cloud it inside there. If we are mindful of our mental temple, I'm telling you that we will be closer to Jesus. Body, mind. But what about our soul? What about our soul? And and can I just tell you that most people, again, if we just think about most people, this is what's in our, we put in our soul. Nothing. We don't attend church, church regularly. We make excuses about all oh, why we can't make it all the time. We never pray unless we're in trouble, then we'll pray. We'll, we won't serve because again, we're, we, we don't have time for any of that. We're not gonna give, that's other people's, more spiritual people, they are, they're the ones that's supposed to give. We don't read our Bible. We don't have community with other Christian believers. We don't, we don't talk about Jesus with anybody. We do a really good job of having other gods in our life, like little idols. And what that really means is that things that we give all of our time, our attention, our, our energy towards more than God, but those things in our life. And, and then I'll just be really straight with you. Then we just start like actually sinning. Like we know that what we're doing in our life is wrong, but yet we just keep doing it. And when we do that, we are not filling our soul up with anything. And so we are literally empty. And Paul actually describes what this this feeling is all about with this type of diet to our spirit. Talks about in Galatians chapter five. He says, the acts of the flesh, that's basically what we do when we are far from God. They're obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and even drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So what this means is, guys, when we rob our soul of anything related to God, there should be no wonder that we feel empty inside. And and that if we don't want anything to do with God and we don't put anything with God in our life, then we shouldn't be surprised when God's like, well, if you don't want me, you certainly don't want my kingdom. That's the truth of what happens. So what would happen if we chose something differently? What if... What if we chose to attend church regularly and we said, you know, I'm gonna make every excuse why I have to get to church. It's that important for me and my family. What if we attended church regularly? What if we prayed when we weren't in trouble and we prayed unceasingly like the Bible actually says? We have an open communication with God. What if we served and got moving and using our gifts to glorify God? What if we gave to the local church and what was happening at the mission of the church? What if we, what if we read our Bible What if we took time to memorize those 316s these next couple of weeks? What if we read our Bible and actually started to see what it said? Now this one says, what if we fast and seek God? Now fasting, we make it more complicated. What fasting really is is when we say no to something for a period of time and when we start to think that we need that thing, we think of God instead of the thing that we, that we, we are fasting from. What if we did that to get closer to God? What if we fasted and seek God? What if we had Christian community? good people around us that we could talk to Jesus with about and Christians to live life with? And what if we decided to not have any more idols in our life? Not to let other things define who we were, but we just said, Jesus, you're the most important thing, and we just followed Jesus. What if we did those things to our soul? Paul is gracious to be able to tell us exactly what that would mean for us as he finishes in Galatians 5, starting in 22. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit of God in your life, is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now listen. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. He, He says that this, this fruits of the Spirit, are what happens when we have our body, our mind, and our soul completely sold out to let the Spirit direct us our life. To have direct access in our life, this is what would happen in our lives if the Spirit had control of our life. But when it all comes down to it, we have to ask ourselves really this question, is that does the Spirit of God in my life, is it a permanent fixture in my home, Or do I treat the Holy Spirit as though my body is as if he was an Airbnb guest in my life? 
right? So, because if you go to an Airbnb, there are limits on what you can do. There's limits on what doors you can open. Some are locked, some are not. There's even some lights you could turn on and can't turn on. There are places that you go, places that you can't go. There are limits on that place. So, is that how we treat God's spirit in our life? Are we keeping doors locked on him? Are we limiting the access that he has in our life? Are we filling our minds with lies or the truth of what God says? Are we abusing our home that, by the way, he gave us? Paul would actually remind us this a few verses later in 1 Corinthians 6.10. He would say that you were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. So our bodies are, I mean, are ours. They were given to us by God. So a disciple marked by Jesus will want 1 Corinthians 3.16 as close to them as they possibly can because it's a reminder of who resides in us. And when God's spirit is inside us, oh my goodness, we are no longer living in timidity but in power. He tells us 1 Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians 1.7, 2 Timothy, I should say, 1.7, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid but gives us power and love and self-discipline. That is what the spirit of God in your life can do. Make you powerful because of his power and love and self-discipline. Because why? The old temple is gone. The new temple is here. And on the cross, Jesus took down the division between us and God. That is what is so beautiful about that. Once Jesus came and defeated death on the cross, I'll say it again, the physical temple became obsolete. So that means we no longer have to go to a place to see God because God is now inside us as believers in Jesus Christ. But so often we neglect our temple. Gosh, we ask God to settle for a temple that resembles a college dorm room complete with an old futon and three-day-old pizza and overflowing laundry closet, right? But as a disciple of Jesus who wants to be marked by 1 Corinthians 3.16, we need to take care of our entire temple. Give the Spirit access to all of our parts, our body, our mind, our soul. And to remember ultimately this, that a disciple of Jesus desires a temple fit for the King. We want more than anything in our lives to live with an attitude that welcomes God's presence in our life all the time. To, to welcome him into our lives, into our body, into our mind, into our spirit. Because the more that he takes over, there is less room for the sinful junk that's trying to hold us back in our life. We can evict that stuff from our life and say, ain't no more room. The spirit's coming in. You gotta go. When we allow the spirit to take hold of our temple we start to understand what Jesus did for us on the cross. Because Jesus died in our place for our sins to take away the barrier between us and God so that we could live with him, so that we could have eternity with him, so that our temple, our lives could be filled with the spirit and no longer of the garbage of this world. But it needs us to welcome him in. So today what we're gonna do is something new and different for communion. So at this time of communion, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have, we're gonna have a song that's gonna be sung, and, but, but we're gonna let you at any time come and take communion on your own. At the front of the worship center, at the front of the auditorium, in the back of the auditorium, there are, there are communion cups already set up. There's bread in the bottom, juice in the top. What I'm gonna encourage you at any time as this song is being sung, you can come to the back or the front to grab communion, take it yourself, we you with your family, maybe you wanna pray real quick, whatever you'd like to do. You can throw away your cups, we'll have a, a receptacle there that you could do that. But I want you to do that on your own and and not corporately, but together, just as yourself. If you need gluten-free communion in the back, you'll notice that there'll be some of that available for you. We'd love for you to to take advantage of that. But at any point, I just want you to be able to connect with Jesus, do some work with him, find out maybe where you're not letting him have some access to your life. And if you've never let Jesus have access to your life, maybe today's the day that you start to let him in so he can start to to evict some things that are in your life, of your body, your mind, and your soul. So again, at any point in a second, I'm gonna pray and then give you a chance to to sing and to worship, but also to take communion, to take some time with God, to connect with him. 
and let him in. Father God, we love you so much. And I just pray right now that as we hear this song, before we worship in just a couple of minutes, God, that we would respond to what you've called us to do. That we wouldn't just be people that just heard this and thought, well, that could be a good thing someday, but that we would act right now. That we would want you, Spirit of God, in our body, in our mind, in our soul. And that we would allow you to evict any negative thought, any negative action, anything that's holding us back so we could be purely yours. And we do that because of what we celebrate at communion. That Jesus, you died on the cross for us, in our place, for our sins, because you loved us. And if we believe in you, we will be made whole, our sins are forgiven, and that now we will have eternity with you forever. But in order for that to happen, we have to say, and if no one has said this before, this is the first time ever, God, I pray that in a room this size, those are joining online, that they would simply say, God, I'm a sinner, and I'm apart from you because of that. I'm behind the veil. But today I realize that I don't need to be because Jesus, you died on the cross for my sins. You've separated the barrier between us to me, to me, between me and God. And today, Jesus, I accept you as my savior. I want you to be in my life. I want the spirit of God in my temple and I wanna be guided by him with my body, my mind, and my soul forever. And Father, you tell us that if anyone claims your son as Jesus, as he claims him as Lord and savior, that the old is gone, the new has come, the temple is clear and now we are holy just as you are holy because your son Jesus makes us that. And so we pray to you right now, ask us to connect with you through communion and allow us to hear from you. You are welcome in this place. We love you, we thank you in Jesus' name, amen.